Hello and welcome to another artist talk. My name is Mona Lurch. I'm the founder of Women United Art Movement. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have this wonderful concept of solo shows. And we've worked with over 70 artists since we launched. So this is pretty exciting as we are like closing the year. Um, and these are our last solo shows. Uh, today... We have a phenomenal artist that I'm so excited about having her here and, and listening to her today, uh, Leah Nado. She is a Seattle-based contemporary abstract artist known for her use of geometric compositions, bold color stories, and signature line work. She creates a unique rhythm between chroma and contrast as she paints lending every painting an immediate sense of vitality. She's here today to talk about her current solo show called Organized Chaos, a painted alternate reality. Leah, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm really um, honored and grateful to be a part of Women United Artists Movement. Um, this show really encompasses all of my works since uh, about 2019. I decided to call the show Organized Chaos because I really think that there's, um, in every composition that I make, it's very busy, but they all come together to complement one another by all my markings and color choices. So although it is chaotic, uh, there's a method to my madness. And so I thought perfect name would be organized chaos. Um, also the painted reality part, um, because of my ADHD and OCD, I use art to kind of calm my brain. And so I'm creating an alternate reality when I pick up a brush and start painting. Um, and I make that reality whimsical and colorful. And, um, I, love the little painted realities that I create within canvas uh, on a canvas and my hope is that when people collect my work they are taken on a, a kind of a story or a journey within the canvas um, and that reality is transferred to them. So I'll share my screen and we can have a look at your show and go piece by piece. Okay. Uh, should I just introduce them? Yeah. Okay. So I think it's very fitting that you actually started because I allowed you to curate this show after choosing them, that you started with this one because this painting in 2018 was completely different. Um, it was just a bunch of black and white brush strokes and it had no line work at all. And it was the first painting I created that was completely monochrome, black and white. And I had it for a few years until 2022. And I decided I don't want to like completely ruin this painting, but it is, it's not really on the same level as what I can create now. So I decided to add to the painting. And so I started adding some, uh, you know, color blocking and drips and other, other colors and instead of just the black and white. And it really came together to kind of merge my old style and my new style into this colorful but muted abstract cityscape. So I ended up naming this one formerly known as Newsprint because the original was called Newsprint because I thought it looked like an you know like a newspaper and so this one's really is one of my more near and dear pieces because it's kind of like you a kind of a reminder of like you've grown so much you've done this and it's like one of those ones I secretly hope doesn't sell so I can keep displaying it in my own home but um 
Yeah, I really like this one. And because it kind of just shows me where how far I've come. Okay, so this one I made very recently. It's called It's Just a Spark, But It's Enough. And essentially the meaning of the painting is when you find something in life that sets your soul on fire, it will guide you through the darkness on your darkness or on the dark in the darkest times of your life. So for me, that's art. And so this painting really is a representation of art being my lantern through the hardest times in my life. And the title, it's just a spark, but it's enough, was actually a lyric taken from one of my favorite bands, Paramore, their song, um, Last Hope. And uh, the, the band wrote it about essentially depression. And so it really, the song really resonated with me. And so this is my interpretation of that song and Last Hope, their music is their last hope art is my last hope. So it's not only a nod to my passion in life, but also a nod to my favorite band and their passion. This one is called Viva Las Vegas. And it is, although it's obviously a nod to Elvis, what makes it important is that, um, I grew up listening to Elvis with my grandfather and in, in 2021, he passed away, which was really tough for me because he helped raise me and he was essentially a father to me. And so after he died, I didn't allow myself to look at photos of us together, think about him because it was too painful. And so this in 2023 marked myself allowing myself to see photos of us together again, listening to Elvis, listening to music, because it made me more nostalgic than upset at this point in time. So I was allowing myself to enjoy music that, you know, we listen to all the time, like Elvis. And so it's a celebration of getting out of the mourning period where it's too painful to really um, enjoy old memories. Uh, and suddenly you, you realize, no, I need these memories because they're all I have. And so it's really a celebration of leaving a morning period. And so I thought it would be fitting to call it Viva Las Vegas because it's one of my favorite songs by Elvis. Um, and I just feel like that it's got that like mid-century modern vibe. So the, the title was very fitting. So that's very much so one of the paintings I have dedicated to my grandfather. And you'll see a couple more that are as well. Okay, this one is called Dune. It's one of my current favorites because the colors just speak to me so much. If I could paint with blue and silver and like yellow, I would do it every day. But you know, it, you know, you can't do that. It, it gets boring. <laughs> Um, but blue really speaks to me. And so this one reminded me when I was creating it, the composition, if you look closely, it's got a lot of like really um, tiny hatch marks and circles. And it almost looks like a grid. So people would probably look at this and think, oh, it's an abstract cityscape. But when I was creating it, it really reminded me of when I was watching Dune, the movie, and that's a huge favorite in this household. We're, we're me and my partner are huge movie nerds. And so as soon as Dune came out, we saw it in theaters. We um, then bought the DVD and watched it several times. And he's actually read the book. I have not. It's on my list. But it was such a cinematic experience. And I feel like it rarely comes along, like movies rarely come along now where you're like, whoa, like whoa, that was an absolute experience because I am a former film student and I feel like a lot of the best movies have already been made and it's hard to find movies that like live up to it. And I know that's a controversial topic because there's a ton of filmmakers out there right now that are doing an am amazing work, but I really do like a lot of movies from like the 50s, 60s, 70s, but Dune was a remake.
But um, I've seen both movies and I think the newest one controversially is way better. And so this is essentially me on the journey of watching Doom. And it's this style specifically is my evolved style. So it's, you know, obviously you can look at it and you recognize my style there, but it's got elements that are newly discovered that I've been using in my work. Uh, specifically a brayer, which I'm trying to see if I have one here, if you don't know what it is, but I don't think I do. It's essentially like a, almost like a rolling pin. And I use that throughout this to mix the paint shades together. So it's kind of got this shimmery effect um, on some of the blue and some of that sand color. And sand is a very prevalent uh, theme you see in Dune. And so this is one of my proud works because I love that I experimented so much and I am going back to, you know, play. And sometimes you just get stuck in doing the same thing over and over again and the work looks the same, but it's important to push myself. So you'll see this is Dune and then you'll see, I think one other one that is in the same body of work called The Falling Sky, where I also used a brayer and other, some new techniques. So this is Dune. It's a nine by 12. It's pretty small on paper, but it packs a punch of boldness. Okay, so this is um, Built by Nations. It is uh, acrylic on canvas. Um, and this one, it kind of touches on how, um, so essentially growing up in like high school and then when I went to college and then when I was in film school, I was always really fascinated by the whole like um, World War II um like society was different back then we you know men had to go to the war go to war and then they came back completely different people um both of my grandparents were veterans so and they always told me like crazy wars war stories so um when i was creating this one i was thinking about when my grandfather stormed the beach in normandy and he was one of like three people who actually survived because there was like a landmine that exploded and it kind of explores the themes of like how these men would go off to war and they'd come back completely different people because of PTSD and they'd come back to a completely different society that had now been um, experiencing wartime and how we're still exploring ways to help people with PTSD. So it's basically a exploratory piece on the meaning of war, PTSD, and how our nation has been involved with so many wars. And then we just kind of, it's expect people to come back in one piece, but there's no like support systems and so I know it's like a very heavy topic for for art but uh sometimes I like to delve into those topics that really fascinate me and that are harder to kind of wrap your head around so definitely meaning wise I went pretty heavy but I really like the color choices with this one it's despite having a dark meaning I think it's bright and colorful and it tells a very uh, meaningful story. So this one's called Land of Infinite Wonders. And I created this one back in 2021. And it was also a part of my Irving collection, which um, I had created just after my grandfather passed away. And so this one, and then the next one you'll see is very uh, drip heavy. So the, for the process, I take, um, I'm trying to see if I have it here. I take a bottle of paint and I, you know, I I um, put it in a, like, it's like a ketchup bottle essentially with water. And so it makes the paint very drippy. And I like to use gravity to kind of create these compositions, which is what I was doing 
in 2021 when my grandfather passed away. So I made a series of these paintings where I relied on gravity and drips. And I just played with colors I liked. And this particular painting was inspired by a song by Greta Van Fleet, which is my other favorite band besides Paramore. Um, and the song is called, um, um, wait, why am I blanking? Anyways, the song <laughs> explores essentially the beginning of a relationship um, and that feeling you get where you're like, it's blissful. All you can think of is like your future together. And like, there's this uh, like infinite possibility in the relationship. And so it was kind of like the, the, the music was taking me away from a sad place and it was uplifting me. And then I was channeling that into the work. And the song is called Light My Love by Greta Van Fleet. I just thought of it. <laughs> So this one is one of the paintings that's actually, uh, it's not for sale and I kept it. It's hanging in my house. Also from the Irving collection, which honored my late grandfather. Um, I find this one just, I, these are like my favorite colors. And when I made this painting, I just really feel like I needed something with the colors I love to make me happy. And so when I finished this, actually somebody offered to buy it, but I said no, because I really wasn't ready to part with it. And I still don't feel like I am. So I actually have never listed this for sale. It is available as a print on my website. So you can like have like a piece of it, but I still haven't felt like I want to list it for sale. And sometimes that happens with my work. I will just keep it for years and then decide, you know what, it's time. It needs to graduate. But this one, I just, I made it in 2021 and I still don't feel like I'm ready to part with it. It is a print and I am okay with that. Sometimes art isn't meant to leave my studio. And this is one of those pieces for me. I think it's really... A, I, I haven't really thought about what it really means in terms of like painting meaning, but I think it has to do with not wanting to let go of like memories, maybe. I'm not sure. I, I haven't, it's one of those paintings where I'm like, I'm not sure, but I'm going to hold on to you because you mean something to me and I just don't want you to leave my side. Okay, so this one is, I made it in 2020. It's a big painting. Um, it's called Enigma. And so I have ADHD and part of that is you kind of get in these like obsessive like hobby um, periods. So like when I was, for example, when I was 14, I was like, I want to be a drummer. And I convinced my parents to buy me a drum set. And I was absolutely terrible at it, but I was having fun with it. So it didn't matter. And um, when I turned 18, I discovered Lady Gaga and I thought she was just, I was like, this is, she's a gift from God. Like she is so bold. She does whatever she wants. She's, she wears giant heels. So I was absolutely obsessed with Lady Gaga until like, very recently and I still I adore her music and I think she's great but I'm not like absolutely obsessed with her like I could tell you like a really obscure trivia about her and like I know her all of her names because she has like a quadruple barrel name and like her real name and so like I was like in fan groups and stuff like that so I kind of contribute that to me being very neurodivergent so this painting essentially is a representation of the chapters of my life where I was absolutely obsessed with pop star Lady Gaga because she's fabulous. She's doing good things for, for the world, I personally think. And But I think this really captures her essence too. It's like bright and bold and 
you just you don't want to stop staring at it. And that's kind of how I feel about Lady Gaga. She's like a unicorn. So I wanted to make something that kind of felt like Lady Gaga. <laughs> I'm glad you like that, Mona. <laughs> um, so this one is called Turning the Kaleidoscope. And I think this one gets the most comments. Um, I showed it in person recently and people would just stop and want to talk about it. I, what makes this painting, I think really special for me is, is another one, like the first painting we spoke about where it was an older painting that I decided to just paint over, but kept the background. So instead of painting white and then starting over, I just started adding to it. So it's really two paintings in, in one. And because of that, it's kind of created this effect where you feel like there's multiple dimensions in it. And it's mystifying to me because I have tried to replicate this painting because I love the effect and it's really difficult to do. Um, and so this one, I really, the meaning for me is that as I mature in life and in my career, I am seeing things differently and I am able to see both positive and negative, but see more positive than negative because I got in this huge rut during the pandemic and I gained a ton of weight and I felt like everything was pointless. And I felt like I was coming out of this terrible mental rut and I was like no like I need to use the the skills I have for good and I can't just rot here because I'm sad and so it kind of marked a turning point after the pandemic where I was like no I need to try because like I'm just coasting and my parents used to say all the time like when I was in school, they were like, you're really smart, but you need to apply yourself more because I used to just not study and I'd go and I'd be able to get like a B or a C and they're like, okay, we get it. You're smart, but like try and you might get A's. So like, you know, for like, uh, you know, a year and a half, two years, I didn't push myself creati creatively. And then I kind of came out of the fog and I was like ready to rise and fight. So that is for me, this painting really um, kind of reignited the passion I have for where I want to be in my career eventually. And I love this painting because I have it in my living room and it just reminds me like, girl, you can do this. Just get up off the couch and you can create, you know, you get some days to the week where you can just chill because you're exhausted, but you need to keep pushing yourself. <laughs> Okay, so Super 8, this one, I wanted to specifically make a composition that was almost like a roller coaster because I wanted it to be the representation of film and like my um, background in film. And so when I came up with this composition, I was like, oh, I told it's this is called Super 8 for sure, because that was the film they used for ages. They fil They would film on Super 8 very affordable film back in the day. Um, and so I wanted this painting's meaning to be like, I'm a former film student. I've got a ton, I've got a, like a visual memory that always connects back to film watching and consuming other media. And so this is going to be like the physical representation of that on a painting. Um, and so it's not really dedicated to any specific film. It's just dedicated to like, my passion for film and how it always leads me to like just this week I saw a movie and I had been so burnt out from painting and then I was like I'm I got back from movie at like 11 p.m and I started painting immediately so um movies and film and tv will always be like the matches to my candle Okay, um, so this one is called The Atomic Age. 
I really love mid-century modern aesthetics. And so this one, um, for me, I wanted to make something extremely mid-century modern. And then I started thinking about the whole, the atomic age and what the meaning of that is. And it essentially touches on the age of uncertainty of when nuclear bombs started being rolled out by all the countries and the fear and the people. And they say that the atomic age is over, but I kind of think it's not over because everybody has nuclear weapons and it's still scary. So I, this was kind of a painting kind of like tongue in cheek of like, is the atomic age really over? The style is probably in the past for the most part. And like me, I love going back in time and bringing that into my decor and stuff. But really, I don't think the atomic age as defined by like, if you look up the atomic age definition, you know, the time of uncertainty from like the 40s to like the 60s. I think that's still happening because we're still in a time of, of unrest and war. And um, for the average person, no matter what country you're in, it's still a very scary thing. So I think this painting is super joyous and beautiful, but it's got some deeper, darker meanings if you actually read what I wrote on my website. So I love doing that with my art. A lot of people are afraid to make like political comments with their art. And I feel like I'm, because of who I am, I'm not essentially, um, like I'm not a professor or someone who's highly educated in this kind of stuff, but I think I'm educated enough to make social commentary about art. And if I have a plat or about political stuff, if I have the platform for it. So I honestly, I think this painting is one of my um, pieces that allow me to do something with color that I really like. I really like the theme of it, um, but it is a social commentary piece. And I think I have one more social commentary piece in this collection. Okay, so this is one of my favorite ones because of the colors. I actually have this one hanging in my house. It's called Interlude in Pink. And the meaning behind this painting is that when I am feeling sad or um, very overwhelmed, I tend to reach for brighter colors in my work because they uplift me. So um, I named this one Interlude in Pink because I figured sometimes you just need like an interlude in your favorite color to continue going about your life. And so this painting specifically, I wanted it to be like supercharged with all the colors I love. And I ju it just makes me happy. So that essentially was the thought process behind making this one. It's got my, uh, you know, chunky geometric composition and it's got like all of my, like, um, the colors that I use when I'm, I want to cheer myself up. So I think the, the name is very fitting for this cheerful piece. Okay. So this one's called Trustfall and it's essentially, um, a nod to this period in my teens where my parents sent me to a confidence building academic camp. And the first thing that they had you do was climb a tree unharnessed and fall into about 20 strangers arms. So you had to climb a tree which had wood like steps nailed into it and you had to go to the top where the branches are and then you fall backwards into these people's arms. And it was absolutely terrifying. But the reason they had you do that as soon as you arrived to camp is because it kind of like empowered you and you automatically like bonded with the people who just caught you and the rest of the camp session was amazing it was like um you would go climbing like rock climbing and it was just very confidence boost boosting and so I think that that camp is like the reason why I can go on social media and kind of spill like my truth and you know be so honest and open with other people because my parents gave me this amazing gift of this once in a lifetime opportunity at this camp. And 
it helped me really um, embrace who I am and make bold decisions based on um, what I was feeling. And so I named it trust fall because the, it was a, tr a literal trust fall that kind of empowered me to forever um, be painfully who I am. Okay, so this one's called The Falling Sky and um, is in meaning is very similar to it's just a spark, but it's enough. So um, and it's also one of my newer pieces where I did use the brayer to um, mix some colors. So you'll see a lot of textures here that you don't normally see on my other pieces because they're a lot more just color blocking and lines where this one has a lot like has cross hatching and it has like splotches of texture. And it's because um, of that pushing that I'm doing creatively in my studio right now um, to kind of like amplify my style and make it more profound. So the, but I'll get back to the meaning. It's similar to, it's just a spark, but it's enough because it is also talking about how art is my lifeboat when I feel like the sky is falling. And so even when I'm feeling hopeless because of chronic pain or something that's going on in my life, I can still rely on art to uplift me because I'm making things that speak to me and speak to other people. And if I didn't have that, I would be way worse off and that I'm so grateful that I have this ability to make things and sell them for a living because I feel like if I didn't have that, I would probably be so depressed and unable to function. And so this is kind of like, this painting's kind of like a love letter to this gift that I have that I don't know what I would do without. Okay, so this one is uh, Though She Be But Little, She Is Fierce, which is a quote by Shakespeare in Midsummer Night's Dream. And I actually took Shakespeare in college where we would read Shakespeare and then essentially analyze the whole thing, which I thought was impossibly hard, but very enjoyable. And it led me to deciding to get my master's in film theory, because that's what you do. It's like your master's in film theory. A lot of people think that I went to school for to like be behind the camera, but I actually went to school to essentially be a film critic. So that is what the Shakespeare class was. It was, it was ter like looking at these texts under a magnifying glass and then pulling out what we thought Shakespeare wanted us to see. And so that really set my soul on fire for me deciding to, to go to the UK and go to this film program. And so I wanted to make a painting that kind of like encompassed the experience I had um, in college that led me down the film path. And I think this was so bright and colorful. And it just, it really did remind me of the, the play that we studied so often. So um, it's also a, a meaning like watch out for the little tiny uh, women who you might un underestimate because I'm one of those people. I'm five two and I have a personality that packs a punch. And I, my mom is not even five foot and she's probably the most amazing woman and she's actually changing the world. She's a healthcare provider and she's done a ton of research in her field. And so this painting honestly reminds me of my mom. Okay, so we have the last uh, couple paintings here. Um, this one's called Turn Off the News. Um, it is actually one of my favorite paintings of all time. I really struggled making this painting. It was probably off and on my easel for two and a half months. 
I could, when I was making it, I, there was something not working in the painting and I couldn't figure it out. And I realized, oh, there's too many warm tones in this painting, which is, you got to have a balance of warm and cool. If the painting is mostly cool, you want only some warm in there because otherwise it would be unbalanced. But essentially I realized there was too much warm in there. Um, but I wanted to make a painting because this was when this painting came out was when the um, war in U Ukraine started. And so we were in this household just consuming so much news and it was giving me so much anxiety. And it reminded me of a time back in, I think it was like 2017 when I first started promoting my art on social media, I gained a following on social media very quickly. And it scared me because I was like, who are all these people? Why are they following me? Why are they messaging me? And I just felt so like terrified all of a sudden. So I actually, um, I ended up seeking out a therapist and she was like, you need to turn off the news, stop reading articles online. Like don't consume any true crime because you're going crazy. And so I think that this, that lesson applies today, like keep current with the news, but there has to be a line where you got to turn it off because it's going to just drive you crazy, especially if you're a sensitive person like I am, who wears their heart on their sleeve. And so I think this painting is a representation of like balance and staying current with current affairs, but you don't want to scare yourself. Um, so this one's called Jukebox, and it really is the representation of when I um, discovered rock music when I was a kid. Um, I remember hearing When the Levee Breaks by Led Zeppelin, and it just absolutely ignited my love for rock and roll. And then I would eventually go on to discover a ton of other bands. And so I wanted to make a painting that had like a jukebox almost feel like what I would imagine a jukebox would look like if you opened it. And so I use these bright colors that kind of had like a mid-century modern vibe because I kind of think of happy days when I think of a jukebox because of that whole like time period. And I'm always connecting stuff back to like film and TV. So I, I really wanted to um, have like this joyful um, piece that felt like a dedication to music and my love for it. This one is also a newer one, and I did something in this one I've never done with any other painting. But wait, let me back up. This is another one where it was a completely different painting before, and then I just started adding to it. It was called Cirque du Soleil, and it was, if you look closely, you'll see there's brown, there's red, yellow, purple. It was super colorful, but then I decided to mute it with uh, watered down white so you could see what was happening in the background and this is the closest I've come to kind of recreating kaleidos turning the kaleidoscope which is that painting where I'm like how am I ever going to recreate this effect but something I did here which I've never done before is I took string and I dipped it in paint and I started dragging dragging it across the canvas and it was making these really cool texture marks which I hope to try again, but it, it's really difficult to do because if you don't keep the, the string flat can completely like disrail the whole composition. But, and I actually learned this technique because somebody who follows me on Facebook messaged me and was telling me how their artist friend had tried it. And I was like, whoa, this is really cool. And so I wanted to try the technique. And so there's a couple patches on this painting where, um, there's really cool effects because I just dipped a piece of st string in, in, in paint and pulled it across and it looks really cool. And when I was finished with it, I was like, yeah, there's like definitely like a stained glass almost effect to it, but there, the darkness kind of like pulls it away from like a normal stained glass. And then this other artist that I'm friends with actually in the area was like, it reminds me of a sunset coming through a clerestory, which is um, essentially stained glass in a cathedral, a specific type of, of stained glass. 
And I started looking it up and I was like, oh my God, like she's so right. So I went with her suggestion in naming it. And I think it really fits the painting, especially because of that, like the, the colors that peek through the black. I think it looks really cool. Thank you so much, Leah, for walking us through your show. It's so interesting. I've seen your pieces so many times by now. And only now as you were talking and I was looking at the pieces, I started noticing shapes. And maybe there are shapes I see and you might not see, or maybe they're intentional. I don't know. But as you were talking, it was like, wow, like there are patterns that like make so much sense. And I absolutely love the way you talk about your work. So thank, thank you, you so much. I would like to give Henny a chance to ask you a question if, you, if you'd like some. If not, I can go, I, I have a ton of questions, but please feel free to jump in. Yeah, yeah thank please. you. Yeah, nice feel free. To, nice to meet you in real life. <laughs> I know, so nice to finally see your face. I love your yeah. hair, it's so pretty. Oh, thank you. It's not always like this, but I thought, you know. <laughs> I know. I did my hair too. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, well, first of all, I want to say, I'm sorry there's not more people on here because you have a lot of followers and they missed out on a great presentation. And I love your explanations because, you know, we see different things um, in your paintings. Also, um, I should say that I'm not a follower of the, your kind of music. So I wonder how you, <laughs> how I'm also older, right? So um, I don't, I don't even know what music you're talking about sometimes, most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder what, we, what you would do with classical music or music from say the Messiah, you know, um, also religious pieces, but not necessarily religious, but just older uh, composers, composers from long ago. Anyway, thought for you. <laughs> um, yeah. what else? I wrote a couple of things down. Let me see your music. Yeah. I think that was it. Yeah. I, I appreciate how you allow yourself to be vulnerable, that we may hear um, you tell us um, what your life is like and what emotions you have and how sometimes life is difficult. I have said a, a couple of things about my life and about my husband. Um, so I understand a little bit. I don't understand totally what you're going through. Um, I appreciate your sensitivity and, and your love of life, really. You've gone through dark times, yeah. but um, here you are and you look lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and you didn't show my my painting, my print. Um, uh, Mona, I, I, got, oh, I bought oh, a print. I, I bought a print, and it's called Blue Ribbon, and it just right away it spoke to me. There's blue in it. Um, there has to be blue and gray. I love I love some of those later later ones that you, that you showed. Um, and I'm not I'm not showing you yet because I bought a frame for it. Just you know, go to Michaels and get a frame. Um, but I realized that it, it needed a border. So I've gone back to that store and they it's on order. And um, and I will show it to you or put it on Facebook or something. Um, and it's, we don't, we celebrate Christmas in the religious sense on, on the 25th. But so the gift giving, I grew up having the gift giving on December 5th because I'm a Dutch Canadian. Um, but now, my one of my sons instituted the gift giving he calls a festivus so have you seen yeah okay so yeah, we do the festivus and it's always on the 23rd we do not have a poll but we just it, it we cover a, a different customs and so one of the customs that we always have is we ahead of time we pick a name and then we write a poem and that's addressed to that so so that's one of the Anyway, so this painting, this print, when it's completed and properly framed, um, will be my husband's gift to me. So I know what my gift will be, but nobody else in the room will know what the gift is. So I'm, I'm excited about that. 
Yeah, and excited about I, how it really will look. Did I ever out. tell you the meaning behind that one? Uh, well, if you did, I don't remember. So yeah, go for it. So if, if you don't mind, Mona. Um, no, 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 go ahead. So when I was making that composition, it really reminded me, it was a swirling composition, but what it really reminded me are of, of the blue ribbons in I used to receive in horseback riding um, because growing up until I was about 20 years old, I competitively horseback rode. Um, I did oh. what's, uh, I mean, if you saw the Olympics, what they do show jumping, I never did that high. I did about three foot, give or take. Um, and so my whole life was going to the barn and practicing because I, I showed my horse on the weekends. So I really wanted to make a painting that was completely dedicated to, um, my old life of, of horseback riding and competing. And I look back fondly on, on the sport and, um, the, I used to have a horse named Chip, and then I had a horse named Sailor, but I really thought that it was dedicated to my life with Sailor because he taught me so much in life. He was a really good horse, and I miss horseback riding, and I think I I like, I like toy with the idea of going back, but it's like I don't want to fall off and hurt myself because I did it a lot, and it's a very expensive sport, um, like $80 a ride. So um, Wow. Yeah. But if I go back next time I go back home, I have tons of friends who, who still ride and they're like, just come to my barn and ride with me. Like it, you don't have to. So I'm going to probably do that. But, um, because I have chronic pain, if I fall off, I'm just going to be miserable. So I think that I, if I go back to horseback riding, it, it would be very much, you know, every once in a while. But so when I made that painting, um, I, was like, this is definitely a dedication to when I used to horseback ride and compete. And I was so into it that like, I remember one time I did a show and I got a second place and then a third place. And I cried my eyes out because I didn't win. <laughs> I was just so into it. It was just a way of life. And I have so many friends that still ride and um, I kind of live vicariously through them. But that original painting was actually purchased by a dentist in my hometown and it's in her office. So it's really cool. Yeah. Cause it's like, I love my the movement in it, the, the whole movement. And, and I, don't, I think to me, it goes bigger and then that movement down. And I don't know. It just speaks to me, you know, I, I don't need an ex. Personally, I don't need an explanation because I like, because I like, I, I go to the art gallery sometimes and, why do I like it? I don't know. Um, but I do love the explanation. Yeah. I think you love animals, don't you? I do. Yeah. I have a yeah. dog right here. He's my little baby. I treat him like everyone's like, oh, your dog's so spoiled. But he's, I just, I don't know. I've, o I've always had animals in my life and yeah. they're just, they make life so much better. I can't believe, I, I got, I adopted this dog about a year and a half ago. And now I can't even remember what life was like before that. Right. Right. Yeah. I have a cat, but I would have a dog if I didn't have a cat, you know, and I love birds and I would have a bird if I didn't have a cat um, cool. like like that. And but I go for walks and I talk to the crows and, and you know, uh, yeah. And I know that crows remember you and they're smart. Um, yeah. So I, so I talk to them and um, I'm becoming more. Well, I, I love animals anyway, but I, I'm becoming more. um I feel an, an affinity to the trees. I live in Halifax and, and Halifax is called the city of trees. And, and you know, we've just lately heard and learned that there's a whole network network underneath in the ground where these trees are connected to each other. And, um, and, and they, they suffer when, when the bad things happen. And so I live in the older part of, of Halifax and there was an old, old church across from where I, where I live and it was no longer being used because it was just too expensive to maintain by the small the congregation just got smaller and smaller. And, and so, oh, just hang on, just hang on. Okay. There's a lot of noise happening in the kitchen. 
So uh, oh. they eventually, the brick was getting soft and it was from 19, I don't know, 1905 or something. So it's, it was torn down, which was too bad, but it, it was torn down. And so um, then the field, it's about four city, not city blocks, house lots wide and about two deep. Anyway, and it just got, there's radon in the city and and um, it affects the people. And so there was a, a testing thing on there for how much radon there was and the grass was growing high and weedy and everything. Anyway, they finally started started building. But before they started building, they cut some of these trees down, like these huge trees along the sidewalk because you know this big machinery has to come in. And I, I, I grieved for those trees. You know, they were so beautiful and old and they've, they've kept a few, but anyway. All that to say is we love creation and we love creatures, right? Yeah. 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 You were supposed to be doing all the talking, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but we're getting to know each other yeah <laughs> it's a good thing these are just so amazing that you know like you you two have never met face to face and this is absolutely yeah amazing. it's great and you live at one end of this uh, the continent and I live on the other end yeah, yeah. although I grew up on, on in BC west coast so, oh, okay yeah. that's not too far no I know <laughs> Seattle the Seattle um, Needle. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah, Space Needle. For me? The Space Needle? The Space Needle. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Or originally it was called Century 21 Exposition. Oh, was that when the ex when Expo was there? When the World's Fair, yep. World's Fair. I went there. I'm really dating myself, but that's okay. That's really cool. I would have loved to go to something like that. Yeah, it was interesting. And then I went to Expo 67 in Montreal. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. That's really that was good too. Yeah. Mona, what do you do? Well, everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm an artist as well. Um self-thought. And then I run this platform and host podcasts, um, publish magazine, <laughs> oh run, run an international art prize. <laughs> oh. So a lot of things that all have to do with supporting women in the arts. Great. That's so great. Yes. <laughs> it, she's, also, she's also my mentor. Oh, really? Wonderful. Yeah. She mentors artists. It's really, um, it's really awesome. I don't know what it. What does an artist mentor do? It can it can do it can be related to anything. So like business, education, mindset, for example. You know, like building confidence and helping out with um, the the necessary things you have for your art practice. So we we just worked recently on Leah's um, artist bio and statement. So the written material that you submit to opportunities uh to galleries for example or you know like you have different opportunities with different platforms or publications and you need to be able to talk, not talk but write about your work so that's what we we did the uh, the last time I still have my homework <laughs> I need to do my homework. I still have mine too <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah but but pretty much um sort of guiding artists in areas they they don't consider their strength, I would say. So oh. a lot of artists, for example, lack uh, business mindset, business education. Yeah, which I is, see that. I don't, I get which that. is necessary, you know, in terms of marketing and promoting your work and so on. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> it's yeah. very interesting for me when I speak about it um, and about what I do because I'm not... As I said, I'm a self-thought artist, so I learned everything as I went. <laughs> because yeah. I have a completely different background. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I have a relative who 
um, she'll say, Henny, you want to go to the library or to the art gallery? And um, I'm a generation older than she is, which is not relevant to anything. Anyway, um, and then I'll say to Jess, what does this mean? Or what do you, and she'll say, whatever it means to you, Henny. And that's true. But I still want to hear what she sees in it. And then, and then I see more, you know, like, like you did, Leah. I see more now and, and why you did what you did in, your, in the paintings. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. Really, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, and, and that's why it's great to have like a, a creative mentor like you because I'm good at saying things in person, but when it comes to like writing them down, there's often a disconnect because of, I wanna say all the things. And so like people like Mona can look and be like, no, you need to simplify this. Cause I don't know what you're saying or, you know, so yeah. Wow. Like now I'm trying to sell on you. <laughs> No, it's 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 absolutely true, but I think it's it's true for everyone because we we know ourselves, and then when we talk or write about what we do, we assume that other people know what we mean. But then, if you have a stranger listening to you or looking at what you've written, they're like confused sometimes. So I think you know a, an extra pair of eyes is always really good for anything it doesn't have to be art it can be anything else but yeah yes. yeah and certain things like certain colors appeal to me more than others like the pinks that you that you like I'm like ho hum you know um <laughs> yeah and that's okay that's okay yep. because um some of the yellows like I love lemon yellow and then so yellows and grays and and that and blues speak to me more I don't know why yeah uh, yeah I had to um yeah I think that your art also the ones that that have like little rectangles in them and, and things like that um speak to me because um all my life I did administrative work so I have a different mind than yours um so so those pieces um are satisfying to me do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, um, well, this desk is a mess, but my office desk when I went up before retirement um, was neat. So, yeah. Certain things um, need to be need to be neat and and precise and yet creative, which I'm not. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's like comforting almost to you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Because I actually have a lot of art hanging in the living and dining room is one whole room. And um, I just, I'll, I have all different kinds of art or prints or, or some paintings. Um, and I, they're all just right, but all very different. Yeah. They're just right, for certain parts, I guess for certain parts of oneself, hey? What do you think, Mon? Yeah, you think so too? Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because sometimes you can have like favorite, favorite colors, favorite shapes, favorite styles, and then suddenly you, you find something completely different, but it works the same job for you. Like when, when that happens to me, like we went, we were in Paris in October and Mark Rothko's um, retrospection, his exhibition, which showcased like, I think it was like 115 or, or more pieces. So this whole building filled with his art and I love abstract art, but I tend to prefer more like figurative pieces. And I found this one piece and I was just sitting there literally staring at the piece for 20 minutes just sitting and I couldn't take my eyes off that piece and it's quite dark actually it's like like burgundy red and then dark gray and then a little bit of white so it's not one of his like brighter colors that he did it was just like kind of dark piece that just like sort of sucked me in and I was like looking at that and couldn't couldn't leave the room 
So sometimes it's really surprising that you would you would have a specific style for art when you're buying art um, or when you admire something and then suddenly like you find something completely different and you're like, wow, that works so much for me. Of course, like I could never afford that piece. <laughs> I know, that's the thing, yeah. But I bought a little postcard. With <laughs> that's my hat, so at least I can frame it to like a little little IKEA yeah. frame or something and put it on. My yeah, phone. yeah, and 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 it brings back that memory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. All right, ladies. So thank you so much for such a lovely chat. That was a bonus. I always love when that happens. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Thank you so much for walking us through the show yeah. um, and I can't yeah. wait to see more works that you create because I'm really interested in you know your new patterns and, and new techniques yeah. what you're exploring because it sounds like you're having a lot of fun with that when you were talking about the pieces I can tell that you're like oh I tried this and um, I can't wait to see more and we'll be in touch anyway <laughs> yeah Thank you so much, Henny, for coming. Oh, yes. oh, it was a total pleasure. Thank you so much, both of you. Yeah, and Leah, of course. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks.